Uh, my name is Danielle Phoenix and this presentation is about the work that I did as part of my doctoral research um, in training to be a counselling psychologist. So the title of this presentation is Exploring How Males Who Encounter Phenomena They Identify as Conversion Disorder or Functional Neurological Disorder Experience Agency in Their Lives. And the focus of this is on agency, how that is experienced. The backdrop is the symptoms of functional neurological disorder, conversion disorder, but it's agency that I'm actually looking at. Now, my interest in this research came from the work that I did on the placements in the NHS with people who had this diagnosis. In the process of the work that I did, working, providing one-to-one -one therapy, I, I recognise that the people who came to me for, or who referred to me for psychological therapy were in a very confused state. They had been told that they had particular symptoms and they had been sent to neurologists and then they had thought that they would have a physical diagnosis and they were told actually there's nothing neurologically, physically wrong with your brain. There's, there's something psychologically that's amiss and for them this was very confusing because they had gone into expecting to receive a physical diagnosis and had received a diagnosis that was mental or psychological and that's what sparked my interest in, in getting into this this area of research the work that I did. Um, so I've mentioned the terms conversion disorder functional neurological disorder these are two terms that there are many in this in this area to cover the symptoms that I, I will be going into a bit more on um, in a minute. Um, another term is medically unexplained symptoms and this particular term says a lot. One goes in for a diagnosis and they're given an undiagnosis. You're medically unexplained so you can imagine the confusion that that might arise. So the symptoms that come under this these, these titles conversion disorder, functional neurologi neurological disorder, symptoms are, can be anything that is, that would be a neurological symptom. So for example, people can demonstrate seizures, paralysis, blindness, hearing problems, Parkinson's symptoms, multiple sclerosis symptoms, anything that you could possibly think of that would have a neurological basis. However, when tests are done, neurological tests, nothing is shown to be amiss with the brain and so the, the same similar type of symptoms that um, are demonstrated by these people don't have the physical cause that one would expect so it's thought that they have a psychological cause. Um, so as I mentioned earlier the focus for me is around agency and that was because people appeared very confused so I wondered well how, how much agency do they experience, how much control do they experience in relation to the interactions they have with the medical profession and how does this confusion that they're expressing to me, how does this affect the symptoms that they have and how might research into this support and provide further information on, on what's going on. So when I talk about agency, um, what I'm referring to is the feeling that we control our own actions and through them the outside world as well as the perception of control which is the belief that one can determine one's own internal states and behavior, influence one's environment and or bring about desired outcome. And that's what I mean about agency, about the, the sense that you are the agent and you are bringing about your own actions and you are in control of your life and the way that you live in the world. So the image that you will see is one of a woman who's showing a spasm and this is a classic image um, that you'll see in textbooks around this area and historically the functional neurological disorder, conversion disorder. Historically, the initial term that was actually used was called hysteria. 
and this dates right back to the ancient Greeks, ancient Egyptians. And hysteria comes from the Greek word hysteros, which is the wandering uterus. And this area of research is an area that has tended to have more of a focus on women. So I mean, if you look at the word hysteria, hysterical females, emotionally unstable, this is, it has a very strong historical context, which is in part why I wanted to focus on a male population, because this is an under-researched population and, and male males do experience these symptoms, but they're, they're not, they don't tend to be explored or recognised in quite the same way. So the first medical, major medical person in historically to really take hysteria into the medical field, the neurological field, was a neurologist, um, Charcot. Now Charcot, he spent much time researching this and he actually looked at these symptoms as functional neurological symptoms. He, he's the first person who came up with this, this term and he he actually thought that it was an area that was also linked to psychiatry and he brought it into the field of psychiatry and looked at um, these symptoms in a way that hadn't been explored before. So he was the pioneer of this research. Now the psychiatric um, diagnostic manuals, the DCM-5, which is the most recent one, the ICD-10, these both the descriptions that they show of, so the DSM talks about functional neurological symptoms, just like Charcot did. And the, the ICD-10 talks about conversion disorder. Freud was a student of Charcot and Freud described um, this area, conversion disorder, functional neurological disorder, more in terms of the emotional being converted into the physical as a result of suppressed um, trauma, emotions suppressed as a result of trauma. And these diagnostic systems show that in essence history hasn't changed, and yet we still have the same dilemma of people going to, to see neurologists and finding themselves feeling unexplained, feeling confused and, and not quite knowing how to, how to go about their lives and how they can be supported. And that, that was, that's why I've fundamentally been involved in this research. So historically, as I mentioned earlier, hysteria, or conversion disorder, functional neurological disorder, is it's primarily been a female condition. So although Charcot was one of the, the people who did focus on males, and it wasn't actually that reported as much as he focused on it, um, there have been cases of men, but they just haven't been as publicly displayed. So that's why I've decided to, to focus on this. Um, in my own personal experience as a therapist, the, the proportion of men to women is, was probably about one to six. And the presentations of men would, would be slightly different in my experience. Women would show a um, greater proportion of sexual abuse, whereas men it would be more a trauma involving violence or bereavement. Um, so there seem to be that link, but of course um, that would need further research. Um, and research involving males have, uh, veterans have been, there's a lot of research that's been done on veterans who have shown uh, dissociative seizures and PTSD studies, those are focused on men. Also there's the, the interesting point of masculinity within social context and how males perceive their bodies and how they feel that they might need to go about interacting socially and how these symptoms might affect how they come across and that's that might that could potentially come into play in terms of reporting symptoms and how they go about. Um, in terms of the next part uh, which is how I actually went about doing this research, the, the method that I used was, it's a qualitative method, so I've deci I decided to not focus on quantitative uh, research, this is a qualitative study. I used interpretive phenomenological analysis. So this approach is one where I carried out, I selected eight participants, and I did this uh, recruiting via social media sites. Uh, 
uh, people would set up groups who had been diagnosed and I contacted the administrators and the social media, media sites, people would uh, get in touch with me and I initially did a screening interview to assess for vulnerability to make sure that people were, weren't self-harming or weren't expressing suicidal ideation uh, so as to ensure their safety and after the screening interview then I, that's when I carried out the full interviews where I followed a semi-structured interview process and I asked questions involving agency agency in relation to how much of an agent they felt in terms of their body, how they could use their bodies, if they felt in control of their bodies, agency in terms of feeling control of their minds, their psychological states, their emotions, and agency in relation to the social sphere, how they, how much they felt as though they were in control of how they interacted with others, how they were experienced by others, just in the social, the social sphere. So agency was always in relation to the physical, the mental and the social. And that's how I carried out the interviews and I allowed it to be quite, um, allowed it to flow quite nicely. So the eight participants that I interviewed, the age range was mid-twenties until uh, late forties. The majority of people were unemployed and the majority of people were all in long-term relationships. Every single person described having gone through a referral process from experiencing symptoms, going to the GP, being told that it's the symptoms appeared neurological, going to a neurologist, receiving neurological tests, and then being referred to a psychiatrist. Half of the participants went on to see a psychologist for treatment and half didn't. So that was, that's, and all of the symptoms, the symptoms range from seizures to stroke-like symptoms, numbness in arms and legs, uh, migraines, visual disturbances, uh, issues with identity, um, spasms, yes, those were the, the symptoms. In terms of the, the analysis of, once I transcribed all of the interviews, the analysis of my data, I derived five superordinate themes. These were paradox of control, living within a dualistic framework, disconnection from self and others, engaged in a battle or fight, and meaning and reality is dependent on other people. So I'm just going to, to go through these, um, not too much detail, there's quite a lot of detail involved in them. Uh, all of the, each of the five superordinate themes has subordinate themes under them, and I've put a quote under each subordinate theme, but I won't, I won't read out each quote, I'll, I'll briefly go through these. So the first theme, paradox of control. This theme involved participants describing how they had before they first experienced symptoms, they had assumed that control was something that was a given. However, after starting to experience these, these symptoms, starting to have seizures or numbness or paralysis, they seemed to go through a revision of actually what I had thought control was, that my whole concept of control is something different. Control isn't as I had initially thought. So it became something quite um, challenging. So the subordinate themes, reconceptualizing control, it's one of the themes which I've, I've just described. Uh, body disconnected. So this body disconnected, this refers to control in relation to their body, which is quite nicely summed up by this quote. My arm would twist round. Nothing I could have done to stop it. I'm not mentally doing this. So a real sense of not being in control, seeing your body behave in a way that you, you can't control. Another theme, centrality of conscious mind. Each participant seemed to hold control as being in the conscious mind. They all had this focus of, well, if I can, if I can stay sharp, if I can stay in control, if I can stay focused in my conscious state, then I can have control over my life. 
they weren't receiving support meant that they seemed to feel as though they were losing more and more control with the loss of support. So the second superordinate theme, living within a dualistic framework. The, the subordinate themes, identities and conflicts, mind-body duality, those participants seem to show a, a division of identity. For some people, this was actually quite literal. They, in a dissociative period, they would not remember who, what happened, who they were when they were in their kind of normal state. For others, there was a sense of identity that involved emotions like anger or shame, emotions that they didn't appreciate or like, um, they didn't identify with themselves, they seem to try and separate this from themselves. Something becoming and nothing unbecoming. This, this theme came up in relation to their interaction with the, the medical world. So they seem to approach a medical professional with the, the desire to receive a diagnosis and in the receiving of that diagnosis feel as though they have something, they are something, they have something tangible. However, when they received a medically unexplained diagnosis, they seem to experience a sense of, am I real? If these symptoms are pseudo-symptoms, what does that make me? And they seem to, their sense of reality about themselves and in relation to the world seem to be affected by this. Unconscious, conscious separation. This one, this theme, involved a sense of consciousness being something that was very separate to unconsciousness, or unconscious processes, where people would talk about those periods where they would go to sleep as being out of their control and that all sorts of things could happen that they didn't, didn't understand or weren't in control of. The third superordinate theme, disconnection from self and others. This theme involved topics like feeling people felt alienated from, from their own bodies, their own experience of self and from others in the world around them and isolated from themselves and others too. So body as distorting perception. They experienced the symptoms as leaving them in a position where they, they felt their, their experience of self was becoming really disconnected. They didn't understand what was happening to them. I isolate, you isolate, we isolate. Real sense of the more symptoms, the more they experienced symptoms, the more isolated they felt. And a trust and mistrust, expecting the worst, seemed to become more and more um, paramount. This body is not me in, in authority in authenticity. This showed how participants really, they couldn't relate to their body. They saw their bodies as being, when under experiencing symptoms, their bodies as, as not being their own and not, not, not being them and not understanding what, what this meant. And dissevering anger, they all seemed to go through this process of really separating anger out from, from who they were. The fourth theme, engaged in a battle or fight, all of the participants showed a sense of really needing to fight to, to survive, fight to stay in control, fight to keep this other, this other side or these symptoms from consuming them. And a sense of being stuck in frustration in relation to this battle, being head to head the whole time with a fear that they might lose the fight. And battling undesired aspects of self is also communicates this. Now, the final superordinate theme, meaning and reality is dependent on other people. This involved, so the one theme, expecting one's power to be provided by another. So going to the medical profession and expecting to receive information about themselves, expecting to receive a diagnosis. And then when they're not given one that, that makes sense in the way that they're looking for, then there's a real sense of disempowerment arose where people would continue to go back again and again and again hoping for the person, the medical professional, to, to give them this power rather than them perhaps look at their symptoms in a different way and take on power themselves. Knowledge being the door to acceptance. So this was very, um, very key. Everybody sought out 
wanting to understand what does this mean? What is conversion disorder? What is functional neurological disorder? And really not quite understanding this. And, and, and there was the sense of if they could understand it, then it, it would be okay. And responsibility is residing outside oneself, again, in relation to the medical professional. Um, but there was always an underlying desire for cohesion, a desire to be, have themselves explained by the profession that they were engaging with, have themselves accepted by the people around them. Uh, and this, this came through throughout the interviews. Okay, so those are the themes. Now, if we go back to the focus, agency, and we look at, well, how, how, how has this come out? How do these, parent, these people experience agency? Well, in terms of the feeling of being in control, I think there, it's yes and no. So these people, when they're experiencing symptoms, and being in control of their own bodies, then they don't feel in control. However, when they're not feeling, when they're not experiencing symptoms, they actually did describe having a great deal of control because their conscious attention became so focused on the body and when they weren't having symptoms they felt very much in control of their bodies. Um, and the perception of control, so the belief that one can determine one's own internal states and behaviour, influence the environment and bring about desired outcomes. Well this, they described a sense of control around this in relation to isolating themselves, staying within their home environment, then they felt very much in control. But in relation to uncertainty and in relation to the world and how they could engage outside of their home environment, they all described quite a lack of control in this area. And the sense of the agency very much seemed to involve a sense of how connected or disconnected these people, these participants felt in relation to themselves and others. Now, if we link this to previous research that has been done, this, the medical model, which has, has the approach of mind and body as being separate, comes out very much in this research. So the Cartesian duality of mind and body is very striking. So these people have physical symptoms, they go and expect to receive a physical diagnosis, but a physical diagnosis is not given to them. A mental diagnosis is given to them, a psychological one, which is not usually the case in the medical model. If you go, if you have mental um, disturbance or mental issue, you will receive a mental diagnosis, a psychological issue for it, and you receive psychological support. So physical diagnosis receives physical support, psychological diagnosis, and that's how the medical model is, this, this divide between mind and body. However, this area is one that crosses. So they go with a physical, physical symptoms and they receive a mental diagnosis. And that's kind of what seems to be where the confusion lies. It lies in the system that, is, that separates mind and body, which aren't actually separate. We, we are embodied. And if we look at the work of Merleau-Ponty, uh, we are embodied. We have neurons throughout our, our whole body and the perception of our body is, is in our brain. So I think this is something that is quite important um, that's come up from the research. Also, previous research has linked um, these symptoms, these, this diagnosis to trauma. All of these participants described, and I didn't question anybody on trauma, but they all described some kind of trauma. Previous research has linked attachments, early attachment issues, and these participants also described what seemed to be early attachment issues. Emotional dysregulation was also something that came across. So, for instance, the not, not identifying with emotions such as anger. And... Um, Research involving existential uh, philosophers and therapies, therapists, uh, Merleau-Ponty, the one who describes how we're embodied. This research seems to support um, the work of Merleau-Ponty. And uh, Merleau-Ponty might say, well, actually, perhaps these symptoms are a communication, communication to others, 
communication of a feeling of distress um, that they, the people might not consciously be aware of, but they are communicating nonetheless by their actions. And Buber, Buber talks about the I-it and the I-thou relationships, the I-it relationship being a, a kind of a superficial relationship, and the I-thou being that deep and meaningful connection. And it seems as though these people, they, they crave this deep and meaningful connection, perhaps, but keep feeling as though they're a mess, they're objectified, and not met um, in a more deeper way. So finally, the implications for the field and for future research. I think to, to engage with um, the medical profession, to engage with these people in a way where they don't treat them as an object, don't treat them as a set of symptoms, but really try and understand what is going on and try and hear their voice, which is what this research is doing, providing a voice. Um, and also engaging in that way, in a, in a kind of a conversational repair way, is, it will bring agency to, the, to these people. Um, and also doing this research, rich descriptive qualitative data, gives a different kind of uh, information that quantitative research doesn't provide. Limitation of this research was all of the interviews were Skype interviews. Although being a therapist in the area, I felt as though I could derive very rich data despite having the lack of uh, being in person to person. Um, and future research to, to research a female population would also be interesting in this qualitative way. And to look at the, the different themes, to research the different themes in more depth. So the, the identities, the separate identities, the association of identities might also be very interesting to research. And issues of intersubjectivity will be something to, to look at too. And duality um, in general, attachment as well as trauma. Um, and yes, provide, provide more of a voice, more of a, a place for both the medical professionals and the, the people with these symptoms to, to work together and to, to understand and move forward.